It's a busy day. I don't know. We gotta start. Let me start. I, I know. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here for our regularly scheduled full council meeting. The April 17, 2017 full council meeting of the Shadow City Council will come to order. It's 2 o'clock p.m. I'm Bruce Harrell, president of the council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Juarez. Here. O'Brien. Here. Sawant. Begshaw. Here. Burgess. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Herbal. Here. Johnson. Here. President Harrell. Here. A present. Thank you. If there's no objection, the introduction and referral calendar will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the introduction and referral calendar is adopted. If there's no objection, today's agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, today's agenda is adopted. The minutes of the April 10th, 2017 full council meetings, meetings have been reviewed. If there's no objection, the minutes will be signed. Hearing no objection, the minutes are being signed. We have a couple of presentations, and as we um, go through our presentations, we have a, also a public sign-up sheet where people would like to lend some public testimony. So if you signed up for that and you intended to participate in the, in the presentation, that's fine, then we will get through that. And when we get to the public comment, you just say, I've already spoken or something along those lines. But we have three presentations, and we're always excited to have these, and so council member, Gonzalez, we'll start with the first one, and we're very happy to hear from her. Council Member Gonzalez, you have the floor, and we will suspend the rules to allow Council Member Gonzalez to make her presentation. Thank you, Council President. Um, this morning, we uh, will, excuse me, it's afternoon now. I've lost track of the day. Um, so the first <laughs> proclamation, the one that I am um, sponsoring, is related to Cambodian genocide and um, and remembering um, the struggles that our Cambodian community has had to endure as a result of uh, those very dark moments in history. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that this genocide did in fact uh, happen in Cambodia between 1975 and 1979 at the hands of the Khmer Rouge regime. And uh, while we are thrilled to be able to have Cambodian American neighbors and friends and family um, it be part of our uh, vibrant community here in this country. It's important to recognize that, um, that the reason that many of them are here in Seattle and in our country as, as, as a whole is because of the atrocious violation of human rights uh, for the Cambodian community. And uh, it's, it's appropriate and correct for us to acknowledge the fact that that genocide happened and to continue to welcome the Cambodian community into um, into our, our uh, city here in Seattle. As we all know, Seattle has always been a welcoming city. It's an inclusive city. It was, uh, that was the case then, it is now, and, and, it, and it is my sincere hope that it will continue to be well into the future. Immigrants and refugees, simply put, will always be welcome here in the city of Seattle. Seattle is sister city to Sihamville, Cambodia, and our area is home to, to a growing Cambodian American population that contribute to major companies such as Amazon and Microsoft. They've opened, uh, our Cambodian community members have, uh, are entrepreneurial. They open businesses in our neighborhoods and work uh, for and on behalf of the community through countless nonprofits here in our community. Uh, the president of the Sister City Association, Alvin Tong, is with us today, so I want to thank Alvin for being with us today. I also want to thank uh, Summit Mel and Bill Ong for their leadership to bring healing and resiliency to their community. I'd also like to thank uh, Rajana Society and the Cambodian American Community Council of Washington for their commitment and leadership to the community. So with that being said, we, we have uh, signed a... Uh, proclamation recognizing um, this uh, human rights violation and this dark moment of history here in the hope of creating healing and opportunity to come together with our Cambodian American and Cambodian community to uh, recognize um, that April 17th, 2017 be uh, remembered now as Cambodian Genocide Memorial Day. Excellent. The rules are suspended. Wait, it's got, got to get some photos. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have a party, so we'll just bring the party in. This is the photo. 
Would one of you like to share any words? Now would be an opportune time. You don't have to, but if you'd like to, we want to give you the opportunity. Please do. Have. Thank you, Council Member Gonzalez, full council and staff for helping to bring this Cambodian Genocide Memorial Day co proclamation to birth. We are in gratitude and humbled that today, April 17th, the city of Seattle recognizes the pain, trauma, and legacy of war that has encumbered our elders and my entire generation who were born in the refugee camp in Thailand. We hope that today that the city hall will reverberate with astonishing empathy and compassion towards the 2.5 million lives lost during the genocide and the community of immigrants and refugees that are being hurt today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councilmember Gonzalez. Our next uh, presentation is from Councilmember Herbold. Herbold, please. Thank you. And um, I understand there are uh, folks who are family members of Jonathan Moore in the audience um, who will be here to accept the proclamation at the end. Um, just a few words before I um, read the proclamation. Um, I moved to Seattle in um, 1992, and I moved here with um, um, a bunch of friends, um, some of them musicians. And um, I had the privilege um, and occasion to um, be in the room uh, when Source of Labor played quite a bit back in the days. Um, they, um, Source of Labor played with um, the, uh, a band that um, I and my family, we actually um, lived with them. And Jonathan was always just an incredibly warm person and is really one of the first folks from Seattle that, um, that I had the, the privilege of meeting. Um, just want to um, take a moment and really reflect on the contributions that um, he made to Seattle, not just to the music scene, but as a, as a mentor to, um, to youth and somebody who just cared very passionately, um, not just about Seattle, but about the, um, the world that, that he moved in. Whereas Jonathan Wordsayer, the Mayor Moore, was a pinnacle of Seattle's hip-hop music industry since the 80s and has been a big influence since then to well-known artists here and around the world. Whereas Jonathan was an artist, producer, DJ, beloved son, father, community builder, mentor, and ambassador of hip-hop culture, working diligently to promote the work of artists throughout the region. And MC Wordsayer was a founding mother, member of Source of Labor, a classic Seattle hip-hop group that started in 1989 and continued to perform throughout the 1990s with a variety of local musicians, and in 2000 release, released a full-length CD, Stolen Lives, which in 2001 was distributed by, by one of the biggest indie hip-hop labels of that time, Subverse Music. And in 2003, Source of Labor won Seattle Weekly's Music Awards Hip Hop Rap Award for Stolen Lives. And in 93, Jonathan and Source of Labor founded Jasiri Media Group, an artist-based hip hop collective established to preserve and promote independent expression through music and art for the purpose of artistic empowerment, cultural enrichment, and economic independence. In 2001, Jonathan ended Source of Labor to manage many local hip hop artists Jonathan and DJ Hyphen hosted Cube 93's radio station Sunday Night Sound Session, which aired its first episode in 2005. The pair programmed the show independently and quickly be became known as Hip Hop Tastemakers Nationally, giving countless artists from around the world their first radio spins and interviews. This show is still running strong. Whereas Jonathan served as member of the KEXP Advisory Council, provide invaluable assistance on the KEXP documentary se series, Hip Hop, The New Seattle Sound. And Jonathan was a teacher at Franklin High School and a mentor at Miller Community Center, where he dedicated countless hours to nurturing the development of youth. And Jonathan had a successful career as an artist and a musician. 
we acknowledge the love Jonathan had for the city of his birth, the love he bestowed upon his family, our community, and Seattle's music industry, and we honor his legacy by proclaiming his birthday, April 21st, 2017, More Day, a day of giving more hugs, more kisses, more love, more caring for one another at this time and well into the future. Thank you. Councilman <laughs> Herbold. Um, to all of you, I would just like to say that I am extremely humbled and gracious to have this day um, a staple to continue my father's legacy in Seattle, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I too wanted to thank you all for recognizing John. He was a great guy. Um, some people know him, some people don't, but I think after his passing, people got a chance to see who he was and his contributions, and um, we appreciate you guys recognizing him and making his birthday a day of more love and hugs and all that, and we'll continue the legacy, so we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. And the same for me, I'd really like to um, uh, extend my appreciation to, the, to uh, Council Member Hebel and the full Seattle City Council for recognizing John's contributions uh, to Seattle and to the, uh, he loves Seattle. Um, he was born here and he never got tired. Uh, no matter how much he traveled, he loved coming back to Seattle. So it's quite an honor uh, to have him recognized in this way. And uh, so thank you all. Thank you, thank you for being here. Councilmember Herbold has another one she'd like to present. Thank you. Um, this is a proclamation recognizing April as Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. This uh, proclamation was brought to me by the Seattle Women's Commission. Um, the city of Seattle has um, observed Sexual Assault Awareness Month um, in April for, for many years now. And um, likewise, I believe I have some folks here from the Women's Commission excellent, um, to accept the proclamation, and I will um, read it into the record. Whereas the United States government has declared April as Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month, and Peace Over Violence has declared April 26, 2017 as Denim Day in Los Angeles County and throughout the United States, and so Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month and Denim Day were instituted to call attention to misconceptions and misinformation about rape and sexual assault, and the fact that many in society remain disturbingly uninformed about assault and rape. And whereas both events are intended to draw attention to the fact that rape and sexual assault remain a serious issue in our society, and harmful attitudes about rape and sexual assault allow these crimes to persist, and Sexual Assault Awareness Month was first observed by the United States in April 2001 to raise awareness, educate the community about ways to prevent sexual violence and, and support survivors. An International Denim Day has been observed since April 1999 as a symbol of protest triggered by an Italian Supreme Court ruling in which a rape conviction was overturned because the justices felt that since the victim was wearing tight jeans, she must have helped her rapist remove her jeans, thereby implying consent. Sexual assault is a serious and widespread problem in the United States, with nearly one in five women having experienced rape or attempted rape some time of their lives, and one in six men have experienced abusive sexual experiences before the age of 18. And between 15,000 and 19,000 people with disabilities are raped each year in, New York, in North America, and 64% of transgender people have experienced sexual assault in their lifetime. Assumptions about race make women of color vulnerable to sexual assault and show the intersectionality of sexism and racism that is compounded by culture and community values that may contribute to a survivor's willingness or reluctance to seek help about sexual assault. And we must do more to address the unique and complex threat that sexual assault presents to communities of color. Whereas the city of Seattle invests in a comprehensive network of social services and a specialized response to sexual assault that addresses the needs of survivors by providing 24-hour response system, crisis intervention, 
information and referrals in general medical and legal advocacy. And Seattle is striving to become a place where sexual assault is treated as a public health issue, where social perceptions and behaviors around sexual violence are changed, where survivors can access a, an array of services that are culturally appropriate and relevant to their needs, and ultimately where sexual violence decreases in frequency. And the goal of the Sexual Assault Awareness Month is to raise public awareness about sexual violence, educate communities how to prevent it, and give individuals the chance to speak out about ending sexual violence. And we can build an environment and community that stops sexual assault by having conversations about value and consent, healthy boundaries, and positive relationships. And over time, these personal conversations lead to larger shifts in attitudes in how our culture perceives sexual violence. Organizations that support survivors are encouraging people to start personal conversation online and in person where they point out moments when they notice boundary violations, gender stereotypes, or unhealthy relationship ideals in movies, TV, or music. They use social media to promote Sexual Assault Awareness Month and calls on supporters to believe and listen to survivors by amplifying the voice of sexual assault to amplify the voices of survivors on people's lives. And whereas the City of Seattle and the Seattle Women's Commission have partnered to support the Denim Day Initiative, as there is no excuse and never an invitation to rape. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Seattle proclaims the month of April 2000. 17 as Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month and designates April 26, 2017 as Denim Day and urges any, everyone to wear jeans on April 26 to help communicate the message that there is no excuse and never an invitation to rape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, sexual assault and gender-based violence is a top priority for the Seattle Women's Commission year-round, but we focus our attention this month on a critical issue facing not just our community, but many communities across the country and across the globe as Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Month. On behalf of the Seattle Women's Commission, we thank the City Council and Council Member Herbold for proclaiming this month as Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Month and also recognizing April 26th as Denim Day in support of this global movement against sexual assault. Beyond our partners at the city, we also wanna thank many community partners who do this work day in and day out, regardless of the month. We are proud to stand today with the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, represented by Tommaso Johnson, as well as many others who cannot be with us, including the Gender Justice League, Northwest Network, Casey Sark, and the Coalition Ending Gender-Based Violence, and many others. We stand with you every day to support your work in making policies to prevent sexual violence and sexual assault and to promote safety throughout our community and around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Just on behalf of the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, I want to thank you, Councilmember Herbold, and the full council for recognizing this day. Far too many families and individuals uh, throughout our state are affected by sexual violence, and the co-occurrence of domestic violence and sexual violence is a major problem throughout our state. So we thank you for your work. Thank you for the recognition of this issue, and please continue to be a champion for survivors. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Herbold and Councilmember Gonzalez for those great presentations. So at this time we'll take public comment on items that appear on today's agenda. Um, public comment, according to our rules, is for 20 minutes. I've been handed around four sheets of public comment, and so we won't be able to get through all of those, but I think what we will do, unless there's objection from the council, we will, in an effort to try to get everyone to speak, we'll take the allotment from two minutes down to one minute and 15 seconds, one minute and 15 seconds, that way you can start wrapping up, it's not a hard one minute, and that way we might be able to get everyone in here if we work really hard and people comply with the rules. So. Having said that, our first speaker is Michael Ramos, followed by Jen Kaleha. And Michael, before you begin, some of you signed up uh, to support the proclamation that was given. And so if that's the case, I'll still call your name and you could just pass if you'd like and we'll just move on, okay? Michael, the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Michael Ramos, Executive Director of the Church Council of Greater Seattle. The Church Council strongly supports the funding of legal defense for immigrants and refugees. Individuals who receive legal defense have the best chance to have their rights protected, to live here safely. 
work and participate in community life and to strengthen their residency over the long term. Vulnerable families should have every means available for legal support in the face of dehumanizing, demonizing, and hateful rhetoric and action, and the unjust targeting of people seeking to adjust their legal prospects. This support contributes to community well-being and is consistent with Seattle's laws for community protection, equal protection under the law, and racial justice and equity. Church Council is proudly a member of the Justice Advocacy Network and the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network, and we stand with you and Council Member Gonzalez in supporting this legal defense for immigrants and refugees. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Following uh, Jen will be Barakat Kairos. <clears throat> My name is Jen Kajeha. I'm a member of the Seattle Immigrant and Refugee Commission. I'm Mexican. I'm also American, and I live and work in South Seattle, where a lot of people affected by deportations live, work, go to school, and shop. In 2016, 2,355 human beings were deported from the Tacoma Court and the Seattle Court. And since Trump's inauguration, deportations of residents with no criminal record are increasing at an extremely alarming rate. Yesterday, Easter morning, I was at the Tacoma Immigration Prison where there had been a hunger strike. I met uh, Grace Chavez and her three children. Grace is an American citizen. Her husband is um, Armando Chavez. Um, Armando is the Tacoma man who was deported, day, uh, <laughs> deported days after being rear-ended in the highway. You might have heard about this in the news. He was racially profiled from the state patrol who called ICE. <clears throat> Armando received no medical at attention after the accident. Instead, he was held for hours on the highway shoulders, not knowing why he was being detained until eventually sent the to the Tacoma Immigration Prison. Um, he was soon given the opportunity to talk to an immigration judge. He presented no danger to society. It only took a few days for this father of husband to be deported following a highway accident that he was a victim of. Grace and Armando's family have been ripped apart. Their three kids didn't go to school for one month <clears throat> because they have been crying and Can refusing. Can you please wrap up, Jen, please? I'll just wrap up on I the finish. time here. Okay. Did you finish? Go ahead and finish your statement. Okay. I mean, just in a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are you almost finished, though? <laughs> yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, long story short, he's not, he's very hard to, he's not going to come back if um, he didn't have access to an immigration judge. Um, a majority of detainees don't have access to legal counsel. Um, so having access to legal representation increases the chances of somebody not getting deported by 10 times. So please vote yes on this um, legal defense fund. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Following Bearcat will be Janet Gwillen and then Tash Mira Watson. My name is Bearcat Kiros. I am from Ethiopian Community Council and also behind me from Eritrean Association of Greater of Seattle and Abdelahi, a friend of mine, activist. Uh, I am here in support of the Legal Defense Fund. When one focuses on fair treatment of the accused, discovery of the truth remains an important goal of our justice system. It is far worse to convict in an innocent person than let guilty man for free. When the government has the power to deny legal rights and due process to one vulnerable group, everyone's rights are at risk. In 2013, 83% of the people deported from the United States were not given a hearing before a judge. The immigration system contains unnecessary and constitutional lack of rights that's unheard of the criminal justice system. No one should be in immigration detention without constitutionally adequate bond hearing in which the government bears the burden of showing that the detention is necessary to protect against the danger of the community or flight risk. Please pass unanimously the resolution in one voice, the defense pass for the sake of justice. And I'd like to quote as in Mahatma Gandhi, there is a higher court than the court of justice and that is the court of consciousness. It is supersedes all other courts. Please work for the Legal Defense Fund. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.
Thank you to the council for allowing me to give testimony today. My name is Janet Gwillem, and I'm the supervising attorney for the Seattle Office of Kids in Need of Defense, or KIND. We are a um, national organization that serves unaccompanied immigrant children um, with their um, direct legal services and also provides mentorship to volunteer attorneys to represent these kids in immigration proceedings. Um, KIND Seattle office serves children living throughout King County, as well as in Pierce, Thurston, Snohomish, and several other Washington state counties. And we also serve all of the children who are currently in federal immigration custody in Washington state. King County has the largest population of unaccompanied children in Washington state, with approximately one third of the no longer detained unaccompanied children residing in our county. Over 500 unaccompanied children have been released to sponsors in King County between October 1st, 2013 and December 31st, 2016. In addition, since October 1st, 2013, our office has served nearly 1,000 unaccompanied children in King and Pierce counties who are detained in federal custody. It is nearly impossible for children to represent themselves in immigration proceedings. They are unable to present the necessary documents, understand the legal standards required in their cases, and rarely speak English. Janet, can you start to wrap up, please? Nationally, one in 10 children without representation succeeds in gaining protection. Therefore, it is vital that we um, provide more representation for unaccompanied kids and have access to legal services. Thank you for supporting the Immigrant Legal Defense Fund. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Tamina Watson. I'm an immigration attorney at Watson Immigration Law. I'm also an author, blogger, and ho radio show host, and all I do is serving, I serve the immigrant community in everything I do. I'm also the co-chair of the AILA Response Committee. Some of my colleagues are here today, and everything we do is to serve the immigrant community, and we have many, many stories, but because of the lack of time, I'm not going to share many stories from my own, um, my own practice. But I will share that um, as part of the Response Committee, we are seeing the problems on on a very daily basis of what this new administration is doing to the immigrant and refugee um, community here. And some of the types of people that you may hear about today are children who came here as uh, uh, brought here by their parents, uh, undocumented, uh, so-called DACA or dreamers, um, who are now at risk of being deported. We are also seeing victims of domestic violence uh, who are at risk of being deported. Uh, through these executive orders that have been signed, people are at risk of being taken into criminal, um, into the criminal system, whether they have uh, done anything or not, innocent until proven guilty may not actually um, happen before they're deported. So the immigrant legal defense fund that you have proposed is absolutely essential and I commend you for the work that you have done and hopefully will continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. So the next speaker is number six, and I'm going to slaughter because I just can't make it out. But it looks like Sanitar Nell or Samantha. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry about that one. So I got close enough to recognize. Yes. So and then oh, there you are. So and then Sina Sam and Vanna Singh. Um, Singh. Good afternoon. My name is Samit Mel, and 42 years 42 years ago we became refugees overnight. And so we understand personally the impacts of war, displacement, xenophobia, and careless support. So today I ask the council to fully pass the one million legal defense fund to support immigrants and refugees and who came here for a chance to survive and live. So growing up in a broken society and supported through an under-resourced system, um, I have seen the importance of making sure that communities are safe from hateful rhetoric and damaging policies targeting immigrants and refugees. As a community, we cannot stand by and witness the criminalization of our own communities and and we currently have around 30 Cambodian Americans ordered for deportation, and this is breaking our families apart. It's creating unnecessary re-traumatization for our most vulnerable community members. We come from a country who has been carpet bombed secretly under the Nixon administration, up to 2.7 million tons of bombs dropped, the almost the most heavily bombed country in the history of the world. So how can we stand by and not sufficiently ask for this funding to support our immigrant and refugee communities? So as a Cambodian American citizen of this great country, I ask that the full council support and fund the One Million Legal Defense Fund. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, hello, my name is Sina Sam. I am an organizer for Fight, which is former incarcerated group Healing Together. And also I drove here from Pullman, Washington um, as a Washington State University um, staff member who supports our refugee and immigrant students as well. Um, I'm also Cambodian American and I support my community in uh, facing deportations. Um, there are, as Summit mentioned, 30 Cambodian Americans currently right now who are facing uh, deportation within this month and next month, and uh, um, they could easily um, benefit from something like this and uh, legal funds in um, protecting their families from um, cases that is impacted by um, uh, laws that were passed in 1996 that uh, are not only unjust but uh, are retroactive and uh, criminalizing our community when their cases are um, when they went into uh, immigration um, holding so many of their cases are very minor um, instances of um, offenses and uh, with our community being lacking legal advocacy there was not much knowledge for attorneys at that time as well and so um, we know for Daniel Medina, who's a dreamer, he required, oops, I'm out of time, 16 lawyers, $15,000 in bonds. And just imagining this is a dreamer who needed that, what would our community need in advocacy? So please do consider passing this Thank for you. all communities. <laughs> Following Vanna will be Bunthe Chung and then Stefani Ramos. Stefania Ramos, I'm sorry. Please. Good afternoon. Oh. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Vanna Singh and I'm from Tacoma, Washington. I'm also the founder of a group called Tacoma Healing Awareness Community. We serve the poor community that cannot afford legal representation, so they have to go through all the trials and tribulations of finding one. But I support the Legal Defense Fund and I hope that you guys find it in your hearts how much it will help the community who can't afford it. So if we fund it through this, uh, we can make a lot of uh, families stay together and give us that second chance that we need. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, council members. My name is Buntai Chim, and I come here before you um, as part of the um, Cambodian American Community Council of Washington State. I'm here today to ask that you pass the Legal Defense Fund to help support immigrant rights, immigrant and refugee rights. Um, one of the most dire issues facing our community is the need for support around immigration and deportation because of the impact of the MOU signed between the United States and Cambodia and the current administration's aggressive xenophobia and immigration policies. I am personally affected, as are most from the Cambodian America diaspora. My brother is among many members of the community who could be picked up by ICE at any time, being, despite being a productive member of community who has paid society back for his mistakes. The mainstream narrative, narrative of immigration is usually viewed through either a Latin American versus United States or Muslim versus America lens. So the Cambodian community is um, often invisible to society at large, and we suffer collaterally from the current administration's ramped up aggression towards communities of color. As a result, members of our community are swept up, many of which who have served their sentences and have become productive members of society, citizens who continue to contribute economically to the city and add to the rich cultural tapestry of Seattle. Despite the fact that more than one in four, million Cam one in four Cambodians perished during the genocide of the 70s, we are still resilient in the face of adversity and calamity. I ask that you again please pass the Legal Defense Fund. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, thank you very much for having us here today. My name is Stephanie Ramos, and I practice immigration law and removal defense in the Seattle and greater Seattle area. We're here today to, to, to discuss the lack of access to legal representation in immigration courts. But there's also another issue that I think we should be talking about as well, is also the lack of employment authorization that these undocumented people have. And when you're in the deportation system, it is possible to get work authorization, but many times it is never possible for people because they can't get enough days or they don't have enough money for the filing fees. So on one hand, Congress is saying you have to afford an attorney to litigate your case, but they're saying you cannot work in the United States. The scales are not even, and the cards are stacked against the immigrant. 
And statistics show that an undocumented person in deportation proceedings has a three times higher chance of being successful in their case if they are represented by an attorney. At this current time, 63% of immigrants lack legal representation. I had a consultation with a young lady from El Salvador last month who's in deportation proceedings in Seattle, and her case is extremely compelling. She was beaten by her boyfriend twice to the point where she lost two unborn babies. On her third pregnancy, her family gathered all the money they had in the world, and she fled to the United States. She's here right now in removal proceedings in Seattle, and she has no money for legal representation. Can you start she, to wrap up, please? Your time's been out. For she's time. been given one last continuance to, f to find legal representation to fight her case in June. These are the people that we need to be helping, the most vulnerable immigrants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Three speakers are A.J. Honoré, Louise Ortega and Imogene Williams. And I'm just gonna say, it would be very, I know it's tough to keep your minutes, your time down to a minute 15, but it's for everyone's <clears> benefit, <throat> please. Thank you. Please proceed. AJ Adderay, District 7, Seattle. Green Party, Transit Riders Union, and various other pro-worker socialist organizations, regardless of nationality. Um, I was gonna repeat a poem, but I'll get to it. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance last week to talk about the up zone. I'd like to, to acknowledge the votes that would have gone to a 5% uh, allotment for affordable housing. I think in honor of more day, we need more affordable housing, personally. Um, it's gonna displace a few individuals. And I, I've got a little bit of a poem. You can't spell displacement without shame, so there's that. Um, finally, I'll wrap up. Tax the rich, I think we need to do that uh, pronto in order to get some more monies that we're gonna be sadly missing from the federal government and possibly the state of Washington government as well. Uh, we have some initiatives with the Transit Riders Union coming down the pike. A few representatives here from council have shown up to our town halls. I wanna acknowledge those individuals. Thank you very much and we'll continue to have those. And we look forward to seeing other council members there in the future. Resist, persist, and love one another. Down the cubbies, go pilots. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to provide public testimony today. My name is Luis Ortega, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the City of Seattle's Immigrant and Refugee Commission. Uh, just three weeks ago, I had the opportunity to facilitate a listening session with some undocumented students and families, some of them uh, Seattle residents. And the purpose of the gathering was to listen to their experiences, their fears, their anxieties, and also for educators and social service providers to better understand their needs. A high school student who participated in this listening session who opted for writing in an index card about her fears and hopes, summarized, in my opinion, why this legal defense fund that has been brought forward by Councilmember Gonzalez and Councilmember Burgess is so importantly needed in our city. She wrote, I was born in this country, but my mom wasn't. My fear is that one day I will go back home and my mom won't be there because she has been detained. My hope is that if that day ever comes, my community will be there to help us. As I heard these stories, I could not help but think about the resilience of each one of these families. They have for many years, despite being members of our community, crucial contributors to our local economy and taxpayers, endure incredible hardship, and too often they have had to do so alone without limited, with limited access to resources or advocates. This has certainly been in the case of immigration court. But we have an opportunity to change this. Because as a city, we can ensure that no one will ever stand alone and we will always stand as one. I would like to encourage full council for your unanimous support of this important piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Following Imogene will be Bill Ong and then Florian Perganer. Perganer. We lived in Winnipeg in the middle of Canada. And there was a Imogene, is your green light on, dear? Is your green, the green, let's start our time over. There was a family from Eastern Europe and they were facing deportation. And they went into a church. It was Crescent Fort Rouge United Church on Nassau Street and they asked for sanctuary. The church had about 15 minutes to make a decision. And after a time, it was worked out that the kids could attend school without harassment. 
and they had that family for a year and three months. I hope we sent over some groceries. I don't know if we did or not. Now, they were, then they were granted status, and the kids picked up pocket money shoveling snow. We want to show that kind of courage that the people had at that church when they made that decision. We can show that kind of courage. Um, we can pass this legal defense fund and fulfill our promise of sanctuary. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Bill Ong. <clears throat> I'm a co-chair of Cambodian American Community uh, Council. And uh, members of our organization have spoken eloquently about their needs, the request for the $1 million the legal defense fund, and I'm here to support that. Uh, we, want, we are concerned that members of our communities are on the list to be deported, and uh, whether you're Cambodian or other people, uh, but they are members of our community, we do not want to see that. And we wish that the council would support uh, the approval and the, of $1 million defense fund. Thank, Thank you. you. Before you begin, don't start his time yet. Uh, we have Niha Vias and then Robert Gibbs. I uh, just wanted my colleagues to know we've actually extended the time because it would have ended at 2.40, but we're getting through because people are sort of complying with the minute 15. Uh, we're getting there. Florian, you, the microphone is yours, sir. Thank you. Council members, thank you for, uh, for having us here today. My name is Florian Pergenin. I am an uh, immigration attorney. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, American Immigration Lawyers Association, which many of our members are here today. And I'm a proud son of um, immigrants from the Philippines. I come here today to ask your support of the Legal Defense Fund. It's absolutely needed. And to give you some, uh, what, I'd like to give you some statistics for perspective. Uh, according to the American Immigration Council, nationally only 37% of all immigrants who are in removal proceedings are represented. Here in Seattle, uh, from 2007 to 2012, there were a total of 11,300 cases that were adjudicated in immigration court. Out of that 11,000, 65% were represented. Although that seems a lot, that means 4,000 individuals who are in removal proceedings were not represented by counsel. And as Stefania had mentioned earlier, when somebody is represented in, in, in removal proceedings, their uh, chances of success uh, jumps. Uh, exponentially. The figures are 63% to 13%. So if somebody's representative counsel, they have 63% of being granted the relief that they're seeking versus 13% if they don't have counsel. So what does that mean? Having a lawyer basically can mean life or death for an individual. Um, so I just wanted to ask for your support today and thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for your words. My name is Neha Vyas, and I'm in private practice. I used to be the former legal director of Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, and I think this is, my testimony is a good seg segue to the prior one, because I want to give an example today of a client um, who I believe succeeded because she had representation. Immigration law is so complicated. S was a survivor of domestic violence. Um, she had multiple medical issues um, that she was suffering from, and one day she didn't know what overcame her. She ended up taking a $2 pen, her only criminal history. No interpreter was used when she took that $2 pen. That rendered her deportable. After she was scheduled for her immigration hearing, which was the same day as her family law proceeding, she ended up getting late to immigration court. She was misinformed that all she had to do was send in proof for why she was late. She wasn't told that she was already ordered deported. She ended up taking a trip abroad, came back in, was put into deportation proceedings, a second time, no interpreter used, wrong address was put on the paperwork. She never got the notice for her second hearing. Essentially, we had to file two motions to reopen. We had to get her prior criminal conviction vacated for that $2 pen. Um, I really ask everyone today, could you have handled that if you were in S's shoes? So it really can make the difference in terms of life and death for someone by having legal representation. Thank you. Thank you. Following. Robert Gibbs will be Marcos, Marcos Martinez and then Samantha Grad. Thank you, Chairman. Mm -hmm. And council members, I'm Robert Gibbs, uh, founding partner of Gibbs Houston Powell, an immigration law firm since 1977. 
We so strongly support the city funding of the Legal Defense Fund for Removal Defense. As uh, Neil Vias and others have pointed out, the chances of success in these hearings dramatically is increased with the presence of counsel. Um, part of the problem is that the law is so complex, as she pointed out and others have pointed out, the other problem is that um, the courts are struggling with in the U.S. right now, over a 500,000 case backlog. The judges are overwhelmed. The cases are set out in this district over three years to get to trial. So the judges really don't have time to spend working with the respondents to make sure that they're not missing something or that counsel's not missing something. So we see cases both in pro se cases where there's no counsel that get screwed up because nobody knows what to do there and secondly, cases that are so complicated that there's no chance in hell that they could succeed without counsel. Let me give you one example. I have a client who was a young man in Mexico whose father was a mayor in a small town. Can you make it a little quick, Mr. Gibbs, sir? Yeah, I can. And his father refused to cooperate with the cartels. Father was assassinated by the cartels. Son flees to the U.S., gets into removal proceedings, asylum case we were able to present an effective case with a substantial expert on how the cartels operate in Mexico and obtain asylum for him. He would have had no chance, no chance of success without counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Marcos Martinez uh, with Casa Latina, and I'd like to thank uh, Council Member Gonzalez and Council Member uh, Burgess as well for leading on this measure. Uh, I think it really needs to be acknowledged that our community members are being detained because of the aggressive enforcement activities under the current federal administration. And also, as others have noted, detention does not mean that a person is worthy of being deported. We've seen in uh, some high-profile cases, such as that of the uh, DACA recipient, Daniel Ramirez, uh, who ultimately was released. Um, I think that through the combined efforts of some of the legal services organizations, uh, some of which are here in this room, and with your support for this measure, that we can help ensure that our community members receive the legal representation that they deserve so that they have a fair representation and receive a fair hearing and have a shot at justice. So I encourage you to support this measure. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Good afternoon, members of the council. My name is Samantha Grad, and I'm here today on behalf of UFCW Local 21 and the 46,000 members we represent in strong support of Council Bill 118946. Many members within our unions are immigrants and refugees who now call America home. Each and every one of them contributes to the success of the businesses they work for, and in fact, we have work sites where almost every worker there is an immigrant or refugee. These businesses would not survive without their hard work. The Trump administration has created an atmosphere of fear that extends beyond the countries listed in the, in the travel ban. His anti-immigrant policies have created panic and pain for immigrants and refugees across the board. Many of our members are terrified for what this means for their lives and their families. As a city, we have stood up and declared that we welcome all regardless of your immigration status. The immigrants and refugees in our city need the protection and support that this bill provides right now. By passing this ordinance, our city can send a clear message that we will put our money where our mouth is and fight to uphold the values we care about here in Seattle. UFCW 21 is proud to support this bill and we urge you to as well. Thank you. Thank you. Here okay, we have Dorothy Wong. Dorothy Wong, Megan Murphy, and Roxanne Naranzi. Good afternoon, council member. Uh, my name is Dorothy Wong, and I'm the chair of the Asian Pacific Directors Coalition and also executive director of Chinese Information and Service Center, a social service agency that provides comprehensive services to immigrant families in Seattle and throughout King County. I'm here to express support for the Legal Defense Fund to help immigrants have access to legal representation. The executive order is from the Trump administration to halt immigration and deport those who are here illegally have instilled a climate of fear and anxiety throughout the immigrant communities. While his orders to date have targeted only specific groups, all the communities have become fearful and concerned, wondering if they will be next. We applaud the strong stance that the city of Seattle has taken in welcoming all immigrants who make Seattle home. 
However, our communities remain anxious should the next iteration of Trump's executive order withstand a constitutional challenge and people suddenly find themselves subject to action by federal agents. For those who have already been affected, the particular circumstances of an individual's immigration status and of their family situation can vary significantly. So recourse to legal services that specialize in immigration issues is critical, something that we service providers do not have the expertise to provide. The Legal Defense Fund will help these individuals gain access to legal counsel that can help them determine the best possible approach to achieve the outcome that these families need and desire. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I wanted to thank you for um, uh, signing a bill for one million towards the Legal Defense Fund. Um, I was with Washington Community Action Network and we went to Auburn to uh, hear, to encourage the city council there to make it um, a sanctuary city um, because uh, there, there, there is a need to do that in that town. And a, a kid spoke, he was in the fifth grade and they're having real uh, terrors that's interf interfering with their schoolwork and a teacher spoke on behalf of his students. Um, because they're afraid that their parents are going to be deported. And um, I think uh, as society, it's uh, somewhat acidic to um, have these attitudes uh, towards immigrants. And so um, I think it's important to pass it. And the, the strike that's happening right now in the detention center, um, because they work all day for a dollar, um, and it's for profit, this detention center, those types of resistance and the march we had this weekend, I hope that it moves the law forward uh, because just like global warming, these attitudes towards immigrants are gonna destroy, it's like pouring carbon monoxide in family units and that's not what builds society. So thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Roxana will be followed by Farhia Mohammed and Kelly Bomaka. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Roxana, and I'm the Director of Education for One America, a statewide immigrant advocacy organization. On behalf of the organization, I would like to sincerely thank Councilmember Gonzalez and Burgess for their leadership on the appropriation of a legal defense fund for immigrants, which we stand in strong support of. As you know, immigrants caught in the deportation system have a constitutional right to due process and legal counsel, but are not afforded the right to public defense. Since January, I and the organization have received weekly calls about immigrants being detained. One in particular call came in February at 7 p.m. on a Friday night from one of our youth leaders who is a student at the University of Washington. She reported that her father had been arrested by ICE and was now at the Northwest Detention Center with no representation. This young woman turned to us, desperate to secure legal support or advice for her father, given he had an expedited removal. As you may know, what happens in the first hours and days of someone being apprehended can determine the future of their case. And given the shortage of resources and all legal aid organizations being tapped out, we were not able to secure representation for him in a timely manner, and he was deported, forced to leave his family behind. Um, this is just one example um, for the need for trusted and prompt legal advice to secure representation. I thank you for bringing this uh, legal Defense Fund forward, and we stand in strong support. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Farhia Mohammed. I work Southwest Youth and Family Services. Today I am here to ask the council to approve Legal Defense uh, Fund because many of the refugees and immigrants, they face deportation, especially my Somali community, already 291 people deported. Under now, under the deportation, 4,460. Uh, 4, I would like to ask you to consider uh, to pass in today to support for the refugee and immigrant population because without the legal uh, rehabilitation, they don't know their rights, including me. I am here many years, but I don't know some of the, my rights, what to say about the legal, when it's come to the legal services. I will ask you, please, to support this and legal funding. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Following Kelly will be Aaron, Landy Keenan, and then Victoria Minya. Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Vomaka. 
I'm an attorney here in Seattle. I'm not an immigration attorney. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I've been a public defender in this town for about 27 years now. I also, in the last four years, started to do what's called post-conviction relief for immigrants, which means that many immigrants land in deportation proceedings because they have some sort of criminal conviction. And I try to somehow bring to light some sort of constitutional violation in that conviction. Uh, I come today because um, I want to tell you about one client I talked to recently. She was not in deportation proceedings. She is, in fact, a lawful permanent resident of the United States and has been for decades. Uh, and she was um, wanting to naturalize. She's very frightened of the current political situation. She wanted to become a citizen. She was in my office. Uh, she has a one-time shoplift from about 20 years ago. It was clear to me, glancing at her papers, that the shoplift conviction was wildly unconstitutional. I could see just by glancing that there had been significant problems. Let me just tell you it was not in Seattle, for whatever that's worth. Uh, Thank you. She, um, there are different kinds of relief that I can try to secure for her. They have different effects in immigration court and with the naturalization procedure. So I needed an immigration expert to tell me exactly what she needed. She was indigent. She had no money. She had no money really to hire me and certainly no money to hire both me and an immigration attorney. I sent her over to Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. They did not, they are overextended right now. They did not have the resources to assist her. So she was in my office trembling with fear and fearful even of leaving her house to come talk to me. Um, and I believe that she has, is still sitting in her house now. I have this image of her trembling in fear. This is not the United States that I was raised in, and I urge you to do what you can to assist our immigrant communities. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I wanted to ask uh, Jorge Barone, our executive director, to speak on my behalf. Council Member, my name is Jorge Barone. I'm the executive director of Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, and I'm here in strong support of uh, the Immigrant Legal Defense Fund. I want to commend uh, Council Members Gonzalez and Burgess for uh, bringing this proposal forward. I think you've heard uh, a lot from the community about the importance of this. I just want to reiterate two important points. There's very large numbers of people in our community who could be subject to deportation proceedings, not only people who are undocumented, but people who have been lawful permanent residents of the United States for decades. Uh, people who entered the country as refugees are subject to deportation proceedings under certain circumstances. So I think it's important to note that this is going to impact a, a very big, uh, this proposal has the impact to uh, positively impact not only those individuals, but also all of the other community members that are going to benefit from this, including U.S. citizens, uh, children who are impacted by deportation and the immigration enforcement, as well as employers in our community who lose valuable employees when they're, uh, when people are deported. And finally, I just want to reiterate that some of the statistics that you've heard, uh, when people are in, de in immigration detention, they, they get even worse. The representation rates in the detention center in Tacoma are in the order of 8% over the last uh, five years. Um, so I would urge you to uh, support uh, the Immigrant Legal Defense Fund. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is Victoria, Victoria here? Victoria Minya, no? Uh, then how about Velma Valoria? I saw Velma, I thought. Velma's to Velma Valoria. And then our last speaker would be Amy Peck. I'm sorry, we have two more speakers. Great. President Harrell, members of the council, thank you so much for having this hearing. I wanted to say especially thank you to council member Gonzalez and uh, council member Burgess for putting this um, resolution forward. We all know that the federal government has put forward some of the most regressive policies that impact our, mo our most vulnerable population, the immigrants and refugees. Now more than ever, our local government must support this vulnerable population in our city. Immigrants and refugees contribute so much culturally, politically, and financially to our city. They should not be treated as discards. Before you today, you saw a whole bunch of immigrants and refugees from all sorts of different countries. I am one of them. I want to let you know that we are really good in making sure that we can contribute to this city. And I wanted to ask you, please, to vote yes. Together, we will win. Thank you. Thank you very much. The last two speakers I have are Amy Pack and then Vladimir Opal. Opal. Good afternoon. Thank you, Council Members Gonzalez and Burgess. 
for leading with fierce advocacy for the Legal Defense Fund. Our community organizations, Family of Col Families of Color Seattle and Rainier Valley Corps stand strong with Councilman, Council Member Gonzalez and Burgess to affirm our support for the Million Dollar Legal Defense Fund. Folks represents 2,000 plus families of color who stand for racial justice and equity in systems that impact our children of color's agency to thrive. My husband, Daniel Pock, serves on the Seattle Music Commission and alongside with other creative curators such as Jonathan Moore to open up creative pathways for all people to thrive, create loving, cultural, and resistance art that connects us all to each other and to time and place. Art is life, art is culture. Immigrants and refugees bring essential culture and international narratives to the fabric of Seattle's rich, thriving city. Our children of color are impacted as their parents and family members are targeted, detained, and deported. Our elders fear leaving or entering the country on resident visas. Our children are learning fear and devaluation as humans when they're exposed to racist policies and how our communities are impacted by each loss. The Southern Poverty Law Center reports that in 2016, ICE spent $3.2 billion to identify, arrest, detain, and remove undocumented citizens or immigrants. And so we, please, we re, um, request to please prioritize funds to support accompanied and unaccompanied youth, access to the best legal and educational care to move toward becoming dreamers and achieving the opportunity for the high quality of life deserved to everyone. Please put higher barriers for ICE and stronger legal resources for our targeted people of color to the risk of deportation. Each deportation conducted by ICE wrap up, please. costs taxpayers an average of $10,000 and $5,000 plus dollars per month. So we encourage city council members to move the million dollar funds earlier in the pipeline to interrupt the xenophobic federal policies and take away the punitive criminalization of immigrant refugee people, and the, which greatly impact our children. Thank you very much. Hi, <clears throat> hello, I'm, uh, my name is Vladimir Opal, and I represent the uh, Citizens United Council Advisory <laughs> Council of Seattle. And we drafted a statement here, we drafted and signed a statement here, and, um, so our council recognizes the need for a representative body in favor of the ordinary citizen. Our first action has been, agree has been agreed upon is, um, the, is a request to formally remove uh, Mayor Ed Murray. Uh, furthermore, um, we as I wrote on my, we would like to formally um, request the dissolution of the city council. Um, because this would allow so the advisory to council by, just to a matter on our agenda. Okay. This would advise. This would uh, allow for the advisory council to better conduct business in service of in service of our citizens and residents. Our council recognizes the need to immediately address the economic and political I'm emergency. I'm going to ask that you just are you because addressing something the on the council has Vladimir? shown repeatedly. What's that? Are you going to address something on the agenda today, or is this just general? Um, um, it is in the best interest of the Are city you council ignore to recognize me? You're gonna limitations. Ignore me. I'll just have to find its limitations as a revolutionary body into place. You ignore me. I'm going to find you disruptive and have you removed, sir. Premier. Thank you. Thank you. That will end our public comment, and we're going to move into our agenda items. Please read the payment of the bills. Please read the title. Council Bill One One Eight Nine Forty Eight, appropriate money to pay the surrounded claims in order to payment thereof. It's been moved and second. Oh, I strike that. I move to pass Council Bill One One Eight Nine Four Eight. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the bill passed. Are there any further comments? Please call the roll on the passage of the bill. Juarez. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Sawant. Aye. Bagshaw. Aye. Burgess. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Herpel. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Harrell. Aye. Nine in favor, none opposed. Bill passed and chair will sign it. Please read the gender equity. That, that, so, that was just the bills. That's, better, a, that's a warm up for the next <laughs> item. Now this is the item you're going to clap for right here. Please read the report of the, of the Gender Equity, Safe Communities, and New Americans Committee. 
The report of the Gender Equity, Safe Communities, and New Americans Committee, Agenda Item 1, Council Bill 118946, relating to the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, amending Ordinance 125207, which adopted the 2017 budget, changing appropriations for the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs to provide $1 million from the General Assembly Fund in 2017 with an automatic carry forward to 2018 solely to provide legal representation or to provide guidance and referral services for legal representation to indigent Seattle residents and workers in immigration proceedings and establishing centers for the provision of legal representation and guidance and referral services for legal re representation all by three first vote of the City Council. The committee recommends the bill pass. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to move for the adoption of Council Bill 118946. Thank you. Um, this uh, ordinance is uh, designed to add $1 million to the budget for the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs in order to establish a legal defense fund. The legal defense fund um, will be administered as a grant by the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs and will be subject to a competitive request for uh, proposals process that will include consultation with potential um, uh, nonprofit organizations who would be able to use those funds to be able to uh, provide these types of services. The services that are intended to be provided are really uh, with regard to anything related to an immigration uh, proceeding. That includes complex naturalization cases, which we heard some testimony about today. It will also include uh, providing removal defense. Um, and, and really, we're going to uh, bring in community into the request for proposal process to give us a better understanding of how these funds should be prioritized and and what the greatest need uh, for our uh, existing immigrant and refugee community uh, might be. And so um, I'm going to reserve comments for the end, right before the passage of the bill. But I wanted to just describe the nuts and bolts of what the uh, Legal Defense Fund would be and, um, and how that relates to the request for proposal process. And uh, finally, we hope to be able to, once this is passed, uh, we hope to be able to infuse these funds into the community sometime in June. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Burgess is co-sponsor. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much. First, uh, thank you to Councilmember Gonzalez for your leadership uh, bringing this forward. Um, as I said a couple of weeks ago when we first talked about this, uh, I think cities and counties that value and protect immigrants um, are actually stronger communities. Um, recent studies have shown that they have less crime and stronger economies. Um, this particular legislation here will, uh, by enabling and establishing the Legal Defense Fund, will strengthen Seattle and our region and is certainly very consistent with the values that we hold um, and cherish so much. It will uphold the rule of law and protect immigrant rights. It will prevent families from being unfairly torn apart and it will enable our businesses to thrive with the valuable talents that immigrants bring to our community. This legislation is good for people appearing in front of our immigration courts. It's good for our economy. It's good for public health and safety. It's good for all of us uh, as Seattleites. Thank you, Councilman Burgess. I don't know if any of my colleagues like to say a few words about this, what I'm considering landmark legislation. I'll ask uh, uh, Councilman Swat. Thank you, President Harold. I'm very happy to be able to vote in favor of this ordinance to allocate a million dollars to a legal defense fund for detained immigrants. As many of the accounts have highlighted during public testimony, having access to legal representation can make all the difference to the many human beings who are caught in this extremely unjust system. I thank all the dedicated legal service providers throughout this nation who are doing this important work. I wanted to share one story that I was part of with Colectiva Legal del Pueblo, which is a really uh, important group providing such services. Many of them, as one of our speakers said, are indigent and cannot afford these services, so it's really important, the work that they're doing. But they had organized this political action in coordination with the legal defense that was being carried out, and so we were all gathered at the ICE office in Taquila last week in solidarity with Jose Robles, who 
ha who is, um, you know, is, is going to be in the process of deportation, unfortunately, unless we build a movement that will stop it. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because, in my mind, it was a very important confluence of legal action and political and mass action that need to go hand in hand, in my view. And my own experience of being there was really poignant to me as an immigrant, because when you go to this office in Taquila, there's a happy floor where people go for their citizenship and swearing in, where I went a few years ago as an immigrant. And there's two floors up is uh, what I call the room of hopelessness, where so many people end up, where you either uh, go in with, uh, you know, you, you, you only come out with paperwork that you live on borrowed time in the country, or you go out with an ankle bracelet, or you're picked up for deportation. It truly is the room of hopelessness. And it was a room where regular working people end up. There were so many women there, women with children, children with their toys. It is an absolutely, um, it's an absolute indictment of the completely dysfunctional and unjust system that we have. And we were there in solidarity with Jose Robles, who is a family man with children. His young daughters were in tears. And I thought that was the most striking thing about him was that he was a worker who helped build the Capitol building in Olympia, which is the capital of our state. It's such an irony that people who actually laid down the bricks of the Capitol building of our state are uh, also being targeted. And it really highlights how widespread the need is to build our movement. I also wanted to say that because of this, we have to remember that we will not be able to win a decent society on a case-by-case -case basis. So along with the legal defense, we also need to build a political mass movement that stands in solidarity with immigrants. There were there's so, so many important examples. May 1st, 2006, when immigrants nationwide went out on strike and defeated the Sensenbrenner bill. And more recently, we had the success of their approach when Trump tried his Muslim travel ban and mass demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations, shut down airports across the country. That was the starting point for the victory against that Muslim ban. And uh, it, there's another example from history where an overwhelmingly Republican Supreme Court passed Roe v. Wade, which was a landmark abortion rights decision that was under the right wing Richard Nixon administration. All of these victories were won solely because mass movements decided to build independently of the a political status quo. And right now, as another speaker mentioned, our immigrant sisters and brothers are helping to build that movement with hundreds of detainees at the Northwest Detention Center having started a hunger strike last week to protest inedible food, a dollar a day wages, which are slaves wages, and other inhumane conditions. I really thank everybody who has already become part of the movement, and I urge everybody watching this to join us on May 1st, which is International Workers' Day, and also historically Immigrants' Rights Protest Day, so let's all fight together. My colleagues, um, I'll say a few, and then I'll turn it back over to one of the sponsors. Um, I describe this as landmark legislation because, indeed, I think that it is, and I think it's very appropriate that it's coming from a committee with the term New Americans in its title. Um, you know, this rhetoric about making America great again, I think what we're missing is to make America great, you invest in the immigrant refugee communities, that you see the strength that that brings to a country and brings to a city and brings to a county, and you invest in that strength. And so I think this cuts at the core of where we need to go as a civilization. And I look at it as, as an investment. So I'm very proud to serve with colleagues that see the wisdom of this investment and prioritize this in a budget where we have competing demands on the budget and so I think this is what making America great is all about, is welcoming people to our country. So thank you for this, and I'll be very proud to support it when it comes time to vote. So having said that, Councilmember Gonzalez, would you like to close the debate on the issue? I would. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everybody who has um, uh, spoken uh, on behalf of and in favor of the Legal Defense Fund. 
Um, I wanna just take a minute to thank uh, all of the community leaders and members of the community who came out today to provide public testimony in support of this, the Immigrant and Rights, uh, Immigrant, excuse me, Immigrant and Refugee Commission, NORP, Consejo, Casa Latina, API Chaya, Rewa, Ethiopian Community Council, AILA, CARE, Church, uh, Greater Church Council of Seattle, CIASC and so many others uh, who have been incredibly supportive of our effort to um, to make sure that we can find funding for such an important program. I want to thank uh, my co-sponsor, Councilmember Burgess, for working uh, with my office to um, make sure we could find the money and to make sure that the legislation was as pristine and clean as it could be. You're an excellent editor. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank the mayor's office and the city budget office for also assisting us. I want to thank the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs for giving us insight and making sure that we have enough flexibility in the um, uh, underlying legislation to make sure we truly meet the needs of the community. Um, and of course, I want to thank Patricia Lee from Central Staff, who was the primary lead on drafting the, the legislation. And I also want to thank my office staff, Roxana, who helped us organize um, uh, so many of the of the uh, community to be with us today, and um, Genevieve Jones, who did so much of the research and uh, policy workup, and worked closely with members in the community to make sure that, again, our proposal would be one that was reflective of what the true needs of the community are. So, um, Genevieve, thank you so much. I know you're hearing your tweeting, <laughs> um, but I really want to thank you for all the hard work that you did. And then our our most recent addition to the office is uh, V and she has been uh, really helpful in helping us get this over the finish line. So thank you so much for that as well. And I just wanted to note that as we are having this debate, uh, we are standing as one with King County as well, who is currently passing their own funding for, an, for immigrant refugee communities. Um, and they're calling there's the Resiliency Fund, which provides, in addition to funds for legal defense, um, a host of other wraparound um, uh, funding that will really complement what we're doing here in the city. So it's pretty amazing to be um, taking this type of legislative action uh, collectively as one with our county. Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of you know that I come from an immigrant family myself. My parents came here from uh, Michoacan, Mexico, when I was when before any of my siblings uh, were born, they came here as undocumented immigrants from Mexico and lived in the shadows for um, many years, several years before being able to adjust their own status. And um, I grew up in central Washington State in the Lower Yakima Valley, where. It is a common occurrence for people to live in mixed status families, um, whether it's your mom or your dad or um, your aunt or your uncles or your cousins. There's that concept of living in a community where not everybody has um, the privilege of having been born in this country is a reality. And I often remember times when uh, our neighbors who were undocumented had gotten whispers of the fact that there were, that ICE was in the neighborhood and they were doing roundups. And let me tell you, the chilling effect that that has on a community is remarkable. Um, you know, kids stop going to school, people stop playing in the street, nobody goes to the grocery store. These are real life impacts. This fear that we talk about when we talk about the threat of deportation or being detained is not a hypothetical. It is felt by our communities every day. And just because we live in progressive Seattle doesn't mean that our community isn't feeling that same sense of fear. And 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 to me, this is a, a really beautiful opportunity for this council and for this city to truly stand on its values, not just in in not just by virtue of showing up at protests and um, and rallies, but by putting those values into legislation and funding real meaningful resources for immigrant refugee communities so that they can have the best chance, the, their only fighting chance to stay here in our community and continue to contribute positively and not be separated from their families under these draconian immigration laws that we have that have needed to be, um, and that we have demanded to be updated and reformed for many, many, many years. 
Um, and so this is, uh, I'm so honored and humbled to be able to be, be a co-sponsor on this legislation and to advance um, this forward today. You know, at the end of the day, due process, it's a cornerstone of our democracy. And this is exactly what this Legal Defense Fund recognizes, is the concept of due process, the, the concept of, of an inviolable right to be able to access uh, legal representation so that you can have a due process is, is what we are um, doing today. And you know what it is, this is a timely matter for us right now. As we speak, people in the Northwest Detention Center are refusing to eat uh, to protest inhumane treatments. They've organized a hunger strike before. This is uh, not the first time that this hunger strike has been, um, has, has been demanded. And uh, in fact, I, as the former board chair of One America, um, the state's largest immigrant advocacy organization, uh, we, as that organization, commissioned a study that found um, uh, many years ago a string of human rights violations that were occurring at our Northwest Detention Center. And so um, these hunger strikes are absolutely um, important for us to understand what is motivating them, and uh, our fund will hopefully address the need for the representation that those individuals have. Um, and, and my hope is that we will be able to put these dollars to good use so that when uh, Trump continues to uh, assemble his mass deportation force, we have an opportunity to to at a minimum tell our community that we will be there with you, standing next to you, shoulder to shoulder when that moment happens because, because if no one else is gonna give you a fighting chance, we will and this is how we do that. So with that being said, well done. I'd like to vote on this. Well done. <laughs> okay, please call the roll on the passage of the bill. Juarez. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Sawant. Aye. Bagshaw. Aye. Burgess. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Herbold. Aye. Johnson. Aye. President Harrell. Aye. Nine in favor, none opposed. Bill passed and Chair will gladly sign it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Please read the next agenda item into the record. Agenda item two, clerk file 314-376, documents relating to the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs to increase funding for legal representation, guidance, and referral services for indigent Seattle residents and workers in immigration proceedings. The committee recommends the file be placed on file. Uh, Councilman Gonzalez. <coughs> Um, this is a companion uh, bill to the bill that we just voted on. It is a clerk file that uh, puts into the record all of the um, um, statistics, facts, and evidence that would support the um, the Legal Defense Fund and its efficacy in terms of providing um, immigrants with an opportunity to, to uh, adequately defend against removal proceedings and deportation proceedings. And so with that being said, I will... Leave it Very there. Good. Do I need a move for its adoption? Um, no? You do not. It came out of committee, so we can just vote on it. Any comments on this clerk file? Those in favor of the clerk file being filed, vote aye. 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 Those opposed, vote no. The motion carries and the clerk file is filed. We lost our fans on that one, but that's okay. Uh, please read the Human Services and Public Health Committee Agenda item into the record, please. The report of the Human Services and Public Health Committee, agenda item three, Council Bill 118-943, relating to appropriations for the Human Services Department amending ordinance 125207, which adopted the 2017 budget lifting and provides and ratifying confirming certain prior acts. The committee recommends the bill pass as amended. Council Member Beckshaw. Thank you very much. And after what we've just gone through, um, I want to say thank you, Council Member Gonzalez, Council Member Bridges for this. So this one's going to be quick. Last November, during our fall budget, we placed a proviso holding $475,000 in finance general so that our human services department could design what we called the community connector program that would be co-located with food banks in Seattle. They came back to us in my human services committee last week, provided the outline on how they want to proceed. The cost will be less than originally thought, $355,000 we're going to have the pilot uh, gathering the necessary data so we can know how many people are positively helped, what kinds of help do they get, how do they actually get the service there on the spot as contrasted to be handed another phone number or another contact. I'm very interested 
and seeing what we can do to get the utility discount program or capacitors and other things available for people when they show up. So with that, we're re recommending that the proviso be lifted and the committee recommended unanimously that we do so and vote on it in this committee today. Thank you very much, Councilmember Baxter. Any further comments? If not, please call the roll on the passage of the bill. Juarez? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Sawat? Aye. Bagshaw? Aye. Burgess? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Herbal? Aye. Johnson? Aye. President Harrell? Aye. Nine in favor, none opposed. Thank you. The bill passed and chair will sign it. Please read agenda item number four. Agenda item four, appointment 610, appointment of Michael L. Reichardt as member of Seattle Indian Services Commission Governing Council for term to November 30th, 2018. The committee recommends the appointment be confirmed. Back show. Thank you. And briefly, Michael Reichert is known to many of us. He's the president of Catholic Community Services of Western Washington. He's been responsible for managing over 3,300 employees with a large budget, $170 million in his current position. He's been the former director of federal programs for the Puyallup Tribe, and he's also an enrolled member of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe White Earth Indian Reservation. He is very well spoken, well um, versed on the issues, and we're recommending his appointment to the Seattle Indian Services Commission Governing Board. Thank you. Any further comments? Those in favor of confirming the appointment, vote aye. 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 Those opposed, vote no. The motion carries, and the appointment is confirmed. Thank you. Please read the report of the Civil Rights, Utilities, Economic Development, and Arts Committee. The report of the Civil Rights, Utilities, Economic Development, and Arts Committee, Agenda Item 5, Councilable 118944, relating to the Seattle Public Utilities, authorizing General Manager and Chief Executive Officer of Seattle Public Utilities to apply for funding assistance from the Washington State Recreation Conservation Office Funding Board to accept specified grants and to execute, deliver, and perform corresponding agreements. The committee recommends the bill pass. Councilmember Herbold. Thank you. Council Bill 118944 is a Rattlesnake Lake Trail Grant Authorization Ordinance. It authorizes the General Manager for Seattle Public Utilities to apply for funding assistance in the form of a grant from the Washington State Recreation Conservation Office Funding Board to improve the Rattlesnake Ledge. It also authorizes acceptance of the grant should it be awarded. Um, the trail is very, very popular with 200,000 hikers each year as compared to the 40,000 to 50,000 originally assumed when the trail was constructed. Um, SPU is requesting uh, $150,000 to supplement other grants in-kind services from, including in-kind services from groups like Mountain to Sound Greenway to help bring the trail up to a standard consistent with its use. Thank you. I do have one question by show of hands. How many of you have actually uh, been on the Rattlesnake Trail to the top? Oh, okay, okay, just wanted to see. Two weeks ago. Two. <laughs> Any further comments on this legislation? <laughs> Please call the roll on the passage of the bill. I don't care. Suarez. Requires me to be an outdoors. She oh, says I'm I, sorry. she wasn't talking. <laughs> I'm sorry, you get to Brody. vote. You just say I. I. O'Brien. I. Sawan. I. Bagshaw. I. Bridges. I. Gonzalez. I. Herbold. I. Johnson. I. President Harrell. I. Nine in favor, none opposed. Bill passed and chair will sign it. We've gone through our agenda oh, what, one for the more. day. One more. And there's one more. <laughs> there's one more. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the back page. Please read agenda item number six and you can read the short version, please. Agenda item six, Council 118947, relating to the drainage and wastewater systems of the City of Seattle Committee recommends the bill pass. Thank you. Council Bill 118947 um, is the 2017 Drainage and Wastewater Bond Ordinance. The um, Drainage and Wastewater System Bond Ordinance was submitted to Council outside of the annual budget process in order to take, care, uh, take advantage of favorable market conditions. The proposal authorizes a 30-year fixed rate bond issuance of $205 million in mid-2017 to pay for 18 months of drainage and wastewater capital improvements, issuance costs and deposits into SPU's debit debt service reserve fund. Proceeds from the bond sale will fund capital programs like SPU's combined sewer overflow projects, sediment remediation in Gasworks Park and the Duwamish River, sewer pipe rehabilitation, flooding prevention, and other long-term drainage and wastewater investments. 
The bond size is consistent with the 2017 adopted budget. The proposed issuance has been reviewed and approved by the city's debt management policy advisory committee, and all of the projects that are proposed to be funded with this bond issuance have been um, also improved, uh, approved by um, our CIP, their capital improvement program. Thank you, Councilman Herold. Any further question of this legislation? Please call the roll on the pass of the bill. Juarez? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Sawant? Aye. Begshaw? Aye. Burgess? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Herbal? Aye. Johnson? Aye. President Harrell? Aye. <clears throat> nine in favor, none opposed. Bill passed and chair will sign it. Is there any further business to come before the council? Uh, uh, yes, I believe Council Member will Juarez wants it. Make a motion that Council Member Juarez be excused from the May 30th, 2017 meeting. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of Council Member Ware's being excused from the May 30th meeting, vote aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. And then I would like to be excused from the May 22nd full council meeting. Second. It's been moved and seconded that I be excused from the May 22nd full council meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Got one. <laughs> no, the no's don't get it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and with that, everyone have a great day and we stand adjourned. Thank you.